Hey everyone, it's Nick here, and today I'm going to be walking you through the process of how to make a black and white stone lithograph. Now, I should preface this by saying uh, lithography, especially stone lithography, is going to require a lot of materials, uh, probably just stuff that you wouldn't have lying around your house. So the target audience for this video is probably people like my current, former, or future students, people who have access to a print shop who are you know just need a little bit of a refresher, people who like to see how things are done in different ways, or you know just people who like my videos and uh, want to see more of me. I should also disclaim that there are millions of different ways to do a similar art process and this is just one of many ways this is kind of the way that i was taught and the way that i usually teach but there's many other different ways to do it and usually every print shop does it a different way so with that out of the way let's start with the basics and so the fundamental principle that lithography is built upon is that oil and water do not mix and the stone is able to accept both oil and water, but with a little bit of persuasion from chemistry, we can push it towards either accepting only water or accepting only oil. And we're gonna use these properties to our advantage and create a controlled image from it. Let's start with the litho stone. This stone is comprised of mostly calcium carbonate and is most likely mined or originated from what is now Bavaria, Germany. And so because these come from Germany, they're rather expensive and sometimes hard to get your hands on. Uh, so please stop asking me why I spent so much money on these stones. You can use the same stone over and over again as long as you remove the old image from the surface of the stone. So let's start this guide off by doing just that. Let's start with the graining process. And so you probably hear me say graining. Oftentimes it can be referred to grinding, uh, but essentially we're going to sand off the surface of the stone. A similar concept as if you were going to sand a piece of wood to remove the top layer of it. So for this process, you'll want what's known as a graining sink, which is basically a designated area that can support your stone, catch the water so it doesn't go all over the floor, and all the grit can you know stay in one place and not go down the drain because it will clog your drain. And your graining sink can be as simple as mine, which is as a tub with some wood to support the stone, or you can have a fancy litho sink like this one that we had at Truman, which is basically a nice aluminum bottomed sink. And it has a pipe extending about an inch up above the water so that the water can go through it, but the grit will stay at the bottom of the sink. Next, you're gonna need some carborundum grits. Uh, basically, these are little granules of silicone carbide uh, that have been filtered. And so the lower the number, the bigger the granule, and for this, I'm going to be using 80, 120, 180, and 220. Although they don't have to be the exact same as these grits, any number of grits uh, close to these will work just fine. So once you've procured all the items on this list, we're going to start by taking our stone, setting it on the sink, and then using our straight edge and a piece of newsprint to check if the stone is level or not. Uh, oftentimes in shared studio spaces, your stones will not be leveled. And so it's a good idea to go ahead and double check. So you're going to take your straight edge. In my case, it's this machinist ruler because it's the straightest, flattest thing that I have. And you want to make sure it's longer than your stone. Put the newsprint underneath it and then try to slide around that newsprint to see if it moves. And so if your newsprint is sliding around like this one is right here, that means the edges are a little bit too high. If your stone was perfectly flat, your newsprint would not be able to move from underneath the straight edge. So all those places where your newsprint was kind of stuck, uh, we're gonna mark those off as high spots and we're gonna focus on those spots a little bit more when we're greening. Uh, that way it'll be in level with the rest of the stone. And so after checking the stone, it seems like just the edges are raised up and the entire middle area is pretty low. And in this situation, I would actually just recommend starting by filing off the corners of your stone. If your edges are too sharp, it can actually be what's preventing your straight edge from you know, contacting the rest of the stone. I also recommend filing the edges of the stone first because if your edges are too thin and fragile, sometimes they break off in graining and you will get what's known as a graining mark, which is not good. So file off those corners to make a very round edge. And you'll probably want your stone to be wet while you do this, otherwise your file will clog up pretty fast. Now, once I've filed all of the sharp edges, I'm gonna dry the stone 
and give it another check. And now when I place my straight edge over my newsprint, uh, my newsprint is kind of stuck in place and that means that my stone is nice and flat now. So luckily, I didn't have to do too much work. But sometimes, especially for bigger stones, uh, you'll have a lot more uneven places. Uh, like when I did this big stone here, you can see it had a very weird and uneven pattern that needed to be grained down flat. So hit these high spots with a little bit more you know, care and attention and you'll be fine. And so we're gonna start by getting our stone wet. Uh, this water will help carry away the stone dust and so it didn't kick a bunch of particulates in the air and it also provides as lubrication and so wet the whole stone and then we're going to sprinkle just a little bit of our lowest grade carborundum powder in this case it's 80 and you really don't need too much just a little bit and so after sprinkling some on i'm going to use my hand distribute the carborundum grit and so it's all just kind of a nice even coat and then i'm going to take my stone or you can take your levigator and start moving it on the surface. And so there's two main ways to do this. Uh, you can do stone on stone or a levigator on stone. And so for stone on stone, it's a little bit slower of a process, but usually you get it a little bit more flat and you get two stones that are nice and grained at the end of it. With a levigator, it's usually faster, a bit trickier to learn, but for big stones, it's a little bit better. And so I'm going to take my top stone that I'm graining with and I'm going to do somewhat of a zigzag pattern. So I'm just going to kind of zigzag up and down. And then once I've made my way from one side to the other, I'm going to zigzag left to right. And then once I've done that, I'm going to do a few figure eights across the stone, to try and kind of, you know, cover the whole stone, but also keep the pattern a little bit randomized. And so I'll do an up and down, side to side, and then figure eight, and then up and down, side to side, and figure eight again and I would consider that to be one pass and after that rinse the stone and rinse off all the old carbonum grit uh, usually you know it's time to change out your grit when the grit gets a little bit too gray uh, you also don't want your stone to get too dry because then your carbonum will start to clump up and it might increase the chances of you getting an unsightly graining mark so after that rinse and repeat uh, more grit grain again same patterns and I'm going to do about four of these passes of 80 grit and then two passes of 120, two passes of 180, and then two passes of 220. And by doing it this way, it will usually ensure that you get a nice and uniform stone surface by the time you are done graining. And taking extra care when you change up in grits to rinse the entire stone, your hands your graining stone or levigator and the edges of your stone because any of those lower level grits if they transfer up to when you're doing a finer grit will leave a much more noticeable and deeper groove in your stone and now if you're using a levigator the pattern is somewhat simpler you start by wetting the whole stone sprinkling on some carborundum grit rubbing that carborundum grit around and then you pick up your levigator and set it on the edge of your stone. You don't want to set it flat onto the face of your stone because the sharp edges of the levigator might mar up the surface of your stone. And so you're going to zigzag left to right, making sure that you overlap your passes in one direction, and then you're going to change directions to go up and down. And then you're going to do another set side to side, another set up and down, and then a pass that just goes around the edges of the stone uh, twice. And I would consider that to be one pass. And so if you're using a levigator for the first time, it is rather tricky to get a hang of. Now, imagine that center hole is kind of the eye of the hurricane and you want to spin your hand around that hole. You don't really want to spin it like a fidget disc around the handle. You want to spin it around that center hole. And you really kind of make sure that that center hole doesn't go over the edge of the stone because then your levigator will pop off the edge of your stone. Uh, and so, Try to keep that center hole on the stone. And so the only advice I can really say is you really want you know maintain a certain like amount of speed. The momentum is really going to carry you through. And I would say stiffen up your wrist and then loosen your elbow. And you really want this to be a whole arm movement. Uh, if you ever played like violin or something like that, uh, I kind of think of it's a similar feeling like that.
And so just like we would do stone on stone, I would probably do four passes of 80 grit, two passes of 120, two passes of 180, and then two passes of 220 grit. And of course, in between rounds, making sure that you rinse off the stone, all the grit from your hands, the levigator, the edges of the levigator, and the edges of your stone. Now, once you're done, go ahead and dry your stone and you can go ahead and get started on some other things. And I should also tell you that you should avoid touching your stone with your bare hands as much as possible. You don't want to transfer oils from your hands onto the stone because those can make unintended marks on your stone. And so in lithography and printmaking in general, there's going to be a lot of preparation steps before we can actually start drawing and printing. And so the more prep we do now, the less headache we're going to have later. And so don't skip the preparation steps as unsexy as they might be. So how big should I make my image? Well, usually I like to start with how big is my paper? And usually I like to work with quarter sheets uh, just so I can be a little bit more economical with my paper and I'm kind of size restricted. And so I'm gonna take this whole show of paper that I have here, which is about 20 inches by 25 inches and I'm gonna cut it into fourths. So it's gonna be about 10 inches by 12 and a half inches. If you're working with more Western papers, like Stonehenge and Arsh and BFK, uh, those usually start at 22 inches by 30 inches, and you can cut those down into 11 by 15s, and I think that's a pretty good working size. And so, if you're working on your first image, I think 8 inches by 10 inches is a pretty manageable size for your first print. And so, in this video, we're going to be talking about TN bar registration, and for that, usually you will want at least one straight cut edge. Now, once you've got all your paper cut to size, now's the time to decide if you want to pre-stretch or calendar your paper. And so in this instance, we're just printing one color, black and white. And so calendaring or pre-stretching your paper is not an essential step. But if you plan on doing multiple colors, then it is absolutely an essential step to ensure your registration stays good. Now, if you are using textured paper, like my whole show is slightly textured, you can also calendar your paper to get rid of that texture and make your paper really smooth. And smoother papers are usually more likely to get you a nice crisp clean print. And so I like to stretch my paper on an etching press because it's a bit simpler to set up and you can get a lot of pressure. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking a nice smooth piece of plexiglass and I'm going to sandwich my paper in between them, just one sheet, and I'm going to run it through the press with enough pressure that it takes away all the texture from my paper. And so it's a little bit textured before it goes in. And when it comes out, it's a pretty smooth piece of paper. And so once that paper is prepped, I'm gonna take a piece of newsprint and I'm gonna cut it to the exact same size as my good paper. This will help in setting up registration. And then I'm going to take my sketch, which is eight inches by 10 inches. And I'm gonna center it onto that piece of newsprint to kind of simulate where that image is going to be on the good paper. And so if you want to do a little math, you can take the size of your good paper, subtract the size of your sketch, and then take that number and divide it by two. And that will kind of tell you how much space is on both sides of those margins. And so for this part, my good paper is 12 and a half, and my good paper is 10 inches on its longest side. And so if I subtract 12 and a half by 10, and then I take that two and a half and split that in half, that'll be about an inch and a quarter on both of these long edges. And so that's what I'm marking off right here. And then I'm gonna do similar math for the shorter edge. And that will allow me to draw a rectangle that is centered on this sheet of paper. And so I should probably mention that Unless you're using an offset litho press, whatever you draw on the stone will be reversed on your finished print. And so you can see here my finished print is a mirror image of the drawing on the stone. And so take this into account when you're making your sketch, especially if your image includes text. So I can take my sketch and just kind of plop it right into that rectangle, kind of tape it into place. And then we have a preview of what my image is gonna look like on the paper. So now we're gonna get into the TM bar registration. And if you've never done TM bar registration before, it's gonna sound complicated and you're not gonna know why I'm doing these things, but just trust me, 
All right, we're going to take it one step at a time and just follow these steps and it will work out in the end. So we're going to start by taking our good paper and we're going to measure across that straight cut edge and we're going to make a mark halfway in that paper. And so here, this edge is 10 inches and I'm going to mark here at the 5 inch mark. And I'm going to do a similar thing for the other side of this paper. And on the side with a straight clean cut edge, I'm going to take my pencil and draw a perpendicular line through that halfway mark and it's going to look like a T, hence the T and bar registration. Now I could go through every single sheet of paper individually and then measure and mark them one at a time uh, or we can do this handy little trick to kind of mark them all at once. And so jog your paper on that straight cut edge and then with your already measured sheet of paper on the top I'm going to kind of clamp down with one hand and keep the other hand loose and bend my paper and then I'm going to clamp down with the other hand and then loosen the other hand and then release it and bend the opposite direction and then I repeat this motion clamp with the right hand let go with the left spring it the other way around and then clamp it with my left hand and then release my right hand and then kind of spring it the other way back in and it's going to take some getting used to but by alternating this pattern you're going to get all the sheets of paper to kind of fan out like this. And now once all the sheets of paper are fanned out, and so you can see every individual sheet, I can take my ruler and then line it up with both of those halfway points, take my pencil, and then just kind of extend it off of the paper and mark all of the sheets all at once. And then I'm going to take my pencil and make perpendicular marks through all of those to designate those as the T side. And then I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to fan out the other side of the paper and extend the bar mark across all the sheets of paper. Now I'm going to do a similar thing with my sketch, uh, T and bar marks halfway down the paper. And then I'm just gonna designate one side to be the T side. Doesn't really matter too much since it's equal spaced all the way around. And then I'm going to put this onto my stone and we're going to set up the T and bar on the stone. And so try to center it as best as you can. And then I'm going to set some heavy weights on top of my sketch to ensure that it doesn't move. I'm going to take a ruler. I'm going to take a pencil and extend these lines onto the stone. Pencil usually doesn't start to take ink and it'll come off when you wash your stone. And I'm going to mark the edge of my newsprint over here. And I'm marking on the stone, not on the paper. And this line only needs to be about an inch and a half long. It doesn't need to go the whole length of the stone. So once I'm done, I can take my sketch off and then I'm going to clean my ruler and I'm going to set my ruler onto the stone. And then I'm going to use an X-Acto knife or some sort of box cutter and just kind of engrave these lines into the stone. And make sure that you engrave these lines a little bit longer then you drew them. So you can see here, I'm going about a quarter of an inch in further than where I drew them. This will allow for different tolerances in paper sizes in case I didn't cut them all the same or the deckled edge, you know, makes some pieces a little bit too short or too long. And I want it to be deep enough that I can see it, but not super wide uh, because that'll mess with my accuracy. And the deeper you make it, the more you're graining you're gonna have to do. And so just make it deep enough that you can see it. Now, the next step isn't absolutely necessary, but if you want nice, crisp, clean edges to your image, I would recommend making a bounding box using some gum Arabic. And so if you've got some transfer paper, I have iron oxide transfer paper right here. I'm going to set it so the iron oxide side's touching the stone. I'm going to place my sketch over top of it. And then I'm going to line up the T and bar on my sketch to the T and bar on the stone. And so I want the halfway marks to line up with each other and I want the edge of my sketch paper to be on the perpendicular line on the stone. And I'm just gonna put my ruler on the edges of my sketch and I'm going to take a pencil or a hard object and just kind of draw along that line. And the pressure from this pencil is gonna transfer the iron oxide pigment onto the stone and that will give me kind of something I can see. And since the iron oxide transfer paper has no binder, I don't have to worry about it taking ink when I ink up the stone. It will just wash off. Now that I've drawn the boundary of my image, I'm going to take some gum arabic, 
Uh, in this case, I like to use used gum Arabic because it's, you know, it's a little bit more economical to be used gum Arabic. And I'm just going to take a foam brush, or you can use a normal brush, and I'm going to paint onto the stone. And it's going to act like a resist. So everywhere that has gum Arabic, the crown is not going to be able to bind to the stone, and it won't show up in your final image. And also make sure that you paint the corners of your stone because those can kind of fill up with grease as well if you leave them open. And then let it all dry. Once it's all dry, we're going to bring our sketch back into the picture, line up that TM bar registration once again, and then this time you can tape it into place. Uh, you don't want to tape it without the gum Arabic borders in here because tape residue onto an empty stone will attract ink when you're printing. So once again, I'm going to slip some iron oxide paper in between my sketch and my stone. And then this time I'm going to use a ballpoint pen to draw my image. And so the ballpoint pen is different from the pencil. So it helps me know which sides I've drawn on and which sides I haven't. And then I'm going to go ahead and transfer the entire image to my stone. And when I think I'm done, I'm just going to keep one side taped and then kind of flip it up and down to double check that I've got all the lines transferred. And now once my image completely transferred over to my stone, I can finally start drawing on it with litho pencils and crayons. For this video, we're primarily going to be talking about just drawing materials. We're not going to get into depth about things like touche and autographic ink and stuff like that. And so, in general, lithographic pencils and crayons kind of have a value scale that they work with. And so, uh, if you find a litho pencil or crayon designated as one, it usually means that's a really soft one and it will give you really dark and greasy marks. And then as you go up the scale, usually a five designates really hard or copal pencils or crayons, which end up giving you really light marks. And the different hardness of pencils usually require different etches to be applied to them. And so it's usually a good idea to track with which pencil you drew in which area. And so if I drew in one area with a number five, I wanted to kind of keep track of that and if I drew in another area with a number one, I want to keep track that I drew with a number one in that area. And I do want to take a moment to kind of plug my own litho pencils. Uh, that's what you see me drawing with right now. Uh, I actually came up with my own formula for litho pencils. And the very thin, I wanted litho pencils that could fit into this kind of mechanical pencil holder. And that way it would minimize the amount of times I'd have to sharpen because I'm a very drawing uh, oriented sort of lithographer and I also engineered these pencils to all etch with the same amount of nitric acid and that way you don't have to mess around with stage biting. It simplifies the process a lot and it's what I like to draw with. So if you're interested you can go to my website and purchase a set for yourself. You might find that if you're a heavy-handed drawer the number one and three pencils might break a lot uh, such as with mechanical pencils as well so just be careful. And so as I'm drawing, you might notice that I have a slip of paper underneath my hand. Like I mentioned earlier, it is imperative that you don't let your hand rest upon the stone because the greases and oils from your hand will transfer onto the stone and they'll start taking up ink. And so you want to avoid letting the oils from your hands get onto your stone. And so a slip of paper is not the best. Uh, if you want to be even more careful, I would recommend using a drawing bridge. But if you don't have one of those, a sheet of paper is better than nothing. So. Just remember to periodically use a very soft brush and brush off all of the shavings away from your stone. And that way your hand doesn't kind of smush it into the stone in other spots. And so as you're drawing, you might notice that you can't really get really super crisp lines the same way you would with a pencil drawing. Uh, the only way to get really crisp lines is by scraping. And so if you want to clean up a line or you want to erase an area, you're going to need to scrape with an X-Acto knife. You can also use the X-Acto knife to create reductive marks. And so for instance, I didn't quite like the solid black background in this drawing here. And so I used the X-Acto knife to kind of scrape away and create a reductive sort of mark. And so once you're completely done with your drawing, go ahead and take your stone over to your well-ventilated processing area. And you're gonna to wanna to gather up everything you need to process your stones before you start. And so we're gonna get ourselves two wads of cheesecloth and I usually take these find the middle of it and try to scrunch up the corners up into the middle so it produces me a nice little ball with a smooth side to it and then we're going to get ourselves 
some rosin with a soft brush or applicator, talcum powder with a soft brush and applicator, pure gum arabic, uh, this one's already pre-made, I bought this from Takish Press, about 14 balme, and then two measuring glasses, uh, you want them to measure at least one ounce each, and so for here 30 milliliters is about one ounce. A pair of gloves to protect yourself from the acid, so glove up, and then some nitric acid. And I'm going to be using full strength or 70% nitric acid. Uh, if you have half strength, then use half as much gum arabic or twice as much nitric. And so this is where the magic starts to happen and it starts to get the most confusing for people. So I'm going to make this little graphic on screen to help explain what is going on. So we had our stone and we're going to pretend that we're zooming in way in and pretend that this is the surface of the stone. So we had a blank stone and we did a grease drawing on top of the stone. And the stone has this texture of peaks and valleys. The texture of the stone is what creates the half tone. We're then going to take our drawing and we're going to reinforce it with some rosin. This will help protect our drawing from the nitric acid and not get burned away. And then we're going to brush on a thin layer of talc and the talc will help hold the gum arabic over the whole stone otherwise the rosin and the grease drawing would repel the gum arabic from those areas. After we've rosin and talc, we're going to mix up our etch and etching kind of implies that it digs into the surface or bites into the surface of the stone which isn't technically correct but we still refer to it as an etch. For my pencils it's designed to be etched with an overall etch and so I'm going to mix 12 drops of full strength nitric into one ounce of gum and spread it over my whole stone for one minute. Now, if I'm using traditional stones or corns branded litho pencils or litho crayons, I would mix up three different etches. And so a four drop etch for the areas that I drew with a number five crown, an eight drop etch where I drew with a number three crown, and a 12 drop etch where I drew with a number one crown. And so I would flood the stone with pure gum Arabic and then using a brush, selectively apply my etches to those areas, taking extra care not to put too much nitric in areas that have really light drawings because that could destroy the drawings in those areas. And then periodically redistribute that etch throughout the rest of the stone. So hopefully this is where my almost chemistry degree will help explain some things. The gum is going to suspend the nitric, that way the nitric doesn't completely react with the stone to the instant that I put it on the way that nitric usually likes to react with things. And I'm going to rub this gum arabic nitric solution into the stone. I'm going to use some decent pressure. I want to kind of feel the texture of the stone as I press into it. And I'm going to press it around to make sure that the entire stone has received some of this etch. And this is going to convert the bare limestone into calcium nitrate. We can then take one of our balls of cheesecloth and I'm going to use one of them to kind of take off most of the excess gum arabic and then once most of it's gone, I'm gonna come in with a second cheesecloth and then pretty much keep wiping it until it buffs down into a very thin layer. So you're gonna feel it go from very sticky and then once you kind of get it down to a very thin dry layer, it's gonna become super, very slick. And then I'm gonna let this stone rest uh, for at least an overnight, so about eight hours, uh, if not more. And during these eight hours, the calcium nitrate is going to absorb moisture through the gum arabic layer and form calcium nitrate tetrahydrate. After you're done buffing your stone, you're going to take your cheesecloths over to the sink and just rinse them out underwater until you get all of that gum arabic out of the cheesecloths. Uh, it's going to take a lot of rinsing and squeezing over and over again, but you want to make sure you thoroughly clean out the cheesecloths because they're going to last a lot longer and you won't have to buy unnecessary supplies. And now after you're done rinsing them out, you're going to do what's called snapping the cheesecloths. And basically we're just going to whip these cheesecloths up and down. And the idea is that you're going to accelerate the cheesecloths so fast that the water and gum won't be able to hold onto it. And that way you'll get this mostly dry and most of the gum off of it. Once you've snapped them a few times, flip it over, snap it again, and then hang it up to dry. And I want to emphasize, you want to do this away from wherever anyone's lithostones are sitting. Uh, because all the water that comes off of this cheesecloth could go back into the air. 
and land back down onto someone's stone that's protected by gum arabic and it will eat away at that gum arabic layer and that would not be good and so do it away from stones so it's now the next day and we're going to start our second edge so for this we're going to need our bowls uh, one with water we're going to need a damp sponge you're going to want a nice thick cellulose sponge like this uh, don't use a car sponge because those have soaps that can ruin the chemistry of this we're going to need our asphaltum or you can use some ink if you don't have asphaltum but asphaltum will yield you better results you're going to need mineral spirits and a rag a roller and a glass slab to roll out on and ideally you want a roller or a brayer that can cover your entire image within one pass and so i have this brayer here but this brayer is only seven inches wide in my drawing it's eight inches wide meaning i would have to do two passes across my stone and there would be a big overlap area when i make my second pass and you might get what's known as lap marks so the easiest way to avoid this is to get a roller that is bigger than your entire image so you can ink it up all at once but it is still possible to use a roller that is smaller than your image you would just use stiffer ink and less ink and ink it up more slowly i'm also going to emphasize that you really want a roller or brayer that has a lot of rollout so it has a really big diameter and so the entire circumference of that roller is pretty much going to give you the surface area that you can roll out on so to demonstrate this i'm going to use this really tiny speedball brayer and if this only has about an inch and a quarter of diameter and this gives us a little bit less than four inches of rollout and so you'll see as i roll this out onto the glass slab that you get about four inches of nice and inked up area but after that it's going to have so little ink so not having enough rollout might cause some really uneven inking issues roller tangent aside let's get back to the stone and so we're also going to need everything that we used for our first etch and so we're going to start by dousing our drawing with the mineral spirits and we're going to use our little blue towel scrap to rub out all of the crown drawing the crown drawing is pretty weak and it's very surface level it sits on top of the stone and so if my ink is too stiff it could actually rip the drawing out of the stone and now we're going to replace that void that was left by the crown with some asphaltum or some thinned out ink and this is going to soak into the stone the thin layer and this is going to serve as the base that repels water when we first ink up the stone now buff this into as thin of a layer as possible that'll give you the best results and we're going to give it a minute for the mineral spirits to evaporate off of the stone while that's going on we're going to take this opportunity to roll out an ink slab and the goal here is to roll up very slowly and a very little amount of ink that way you can control how delicate our tones built up if we have too much ink it's going to darken the image all at once and it's going to become too dark the best way to do this is to make shop mix which consists of Senefelder's roll up black and crayon black in about a 50 50 ratio but if you don't have either of these you can do the more unforgiving method of rolling out a super thin layer of ink and so i don't have any shop mix and so that's the route that i'm going to take and so i'm going to start by spreading out a thin line of ink and then i'm going to roll this out nice and uniformly and remember to roll a little bit lift twist the roller and then roll a little bit more so roll lift twist roll roll lift twist roll and so on and so forth and don't forget every now and then to take your roller and flip sides that way you can ensure that both sides are evening out and then continue rolling and then even go in the side to side direction and remember uniformity is king here and i want to emphasize again that for a printing ink roll up uh, you're going to want as little of an ink as possible so even this is too much ink so i'm going to scrape some of this ink up and distribute what is on the roller back to the slab and then after rolling it back out we're going to scrape some more and then roll it back out and it's easier to do it this way than to put too little ink the first time uh, you're going to find it really hard to coat the entire roller whereas this way we're going to coat the whole roller and then slowly thin it out nice and uniformly and so after thinning the ink out a few times uh, this is what i'm looking for when i roll out the ink it's going to be a super thin transparent layer and only turns into an opaque layer after about 10 passes 
And so I'm going to take this and distribute it about as evenly and uniformly as possible. Uh, as you can see, some of the edges have more ink than the middle. And once that's done, I'm going to rack this roller and we're going to turn our tension back to the stone. And so the stone still has a protective gum arabic layer over top of it. And that gum arabic layer is soluble by water. And so I'm going to take my damp sponge and wash over the stone to remove all of that gum arabic and the ink that it was holding onto. Squeeze that dirty water into the empty bowl. And I cannot emphasize this enough. You should get a new clean sponge or thoroughly rinse out the sponge that you're using. Now, I'm not going to in this video because later on in the video, I want to demonstrate uh, how to help solve scumming, but you will see that your image will scum a lot more if you don't thoroughly clean out your sponge. Now, I wanna take a second to emphasize good sponging technique. Squeeze out all the water from your sponge and then grab one corner of your sponge and dip it into your clean water. And now while you're sponging, you're gonna lead with that wet corner and let the dry part of the sponge follow up. And so what this is gonna do is the wet corner is gonna flood the stone with water and then the rest of the sponge that is dry is going to suck up the excess water. And so this is gonna leave your stone with just the right of dampness, but not soaking wet. If you see streak marks like this across your inked up areas, that means you have too much water and you should probably squeeze out some of that water back into your dirty water bowl. If you have too much water, it will act as a resist and it will inhibit you from laying down ink to your stone. And you're gonna pick up that water onto your roller and put it back onto the slab. And it's gonna take you extra time to work that water off of your roller. Now, before the stone starts to dry, you want to immediately come in with your roller and make some really fast passes over your image, about as fast as possible. This will lay down as minimal amount of ink as possible, and you're gonna slowly build up your image, just quick pass by quick pass. Now, once you've rolled your image up to your desired level of darkness or lightness, you can adjust your contrast uh, by rolling less or more than your original drawing. You're gonna let it dry, and so you can use a fan to accelerate the drawing here. Once it's dry, you can proceed like the first edge. So rosin, then talc, then glove up, prepare your etches, etch your stone just like you did the first time. This will help reinforce the calcium nitrate layer and help prevent your stone from scumming up later in the printing process when it really matters. And then again, buff down to a thin layer with the cheesecloths. And we're gonna let this second etch rest for about two hours. Now, if you rolled up using a thinned out ink like I did, instead of roll up black or crayon black, you'll find that this ink gets harder to clean out the longer you let it sit as this ink dries out. If you make shop mix from crayon block and roll up black, uh, those inks uh, take a super long time to dry out. And so they'll be easier to wash out even if you let it sit for, you know, like a week before you start printing. Also, if you've got friends in the studio doing litho, you might as well process your stones together roll up many stones, clean up once, win-win. And so I actually let my stone rest for another overnight. So that's about another eight hours, just because I didn't want to print at nighttime. And nothing wrong with that. You never want to print sleepy because nothing good ever happens from that. So when you're getting ready to print, the process is going to start the same as the second edge. You're going to clear out all of that old ink from the stone. That way we can put in a fresh brand new layer of asphaltum or ink. And while that solvent's evaporating, go ahead and roll out yourself an ink slab. And this time, you're going to be using a good amount of ink to print. And if you're my student and you're watching this, you should just be scraping the top of the ink can for some ink. If you gouge the ink like you're shoveling a hole, you're getting an instant F-. minus. I know the ink is hard, but it's supposed to be stiff. And so it's going to take a while to roll it out. And you're going to want to press pretty hard with the roller into the glass slab to try and really work that ink up. Lithography ink is very tacky and very stiff by design, and so it doesn't fill in your drawing. And so once you work the ink up, it'll start to loosen up. And then when you leave it alone, it'll stiffen up again. Once you've got your ink slab rolled out, we're going to take our stone to the press. And so while we're here, we're going to make sure that we have everything we need to print. And so firstly, we're going to make sure we have a scraper bar. Uh, it's this little piece of wood, or sometimes they're made of plastic, and they have usually a piece of leather or a piece of plastic 
wrapped over the top. And you want to pick a scraper bar that is wider than your image, but it's smaller than the stone. You don't really want to run your scraper bars over the edge of the stone because that'll kind of dent the scraper bars, which will render them not good. Next, we're going to need a grease spreader. Mine's this kind of little pastry knife. And then we're going to need some grease. And I like this lithium red and tacky grease. I find it more forgiving if I accidentally forget to reapply the grease. It still stays relatively very greased up. And then we're going to need a tympan, which is usually just some sort of hard, unabsorbent surface. Uh, a lot of people make theirs from Luxan or acrylic or phenolic boards, or you can even use a sheet of Duralar. The thinner and more flexible your tympan is, the less pressure you need, but also the higher chance of stretching your paper is, and so you have to be a bit more careful. And then we're going to use some newsprint. Uh, this will provide a little bit of padding and also for some test prints. And then, of course, we're going to need our good printing paper. We're going to keep that handy. And then over at my inking station, we're going to need the ink that we're going to print with. We're going to need a glass slab that we can roll out on. We're going to need a roller. And then, of course, we're going to need our bowls, one with water, and our sponge. And so let's start with our scraper bar. And so usually, there'll always be a spot for it underneath the big center screw on the press. And so go ahead and slide it into the slot and tighten down the wing nut knob that's usually there to hold it in place. And so try to get that as centered as best you can. Next, we're going to have to figure out where to start and stop our pressure. This is a step that people always forget until they start printing. So go ahead and back the pressure off of this pressure knob over here. That way it doesn't touch your stone. And then we're going to roll the stone forward until it's right underneath the scraper bar. And so before the scraper bar is over your image, we're going to place a piece of tape on the press bed about in line with this uh, frame of the press. And so whenever this piece of tape touches the frame, that's when I know to start the pressure. And then I'm going to go ahead and roll the stone forward through the press. And then I'm going to stop once my scraper bar has cleared the image. And then I'm going to place another piece of tape right here. And that's when I'm going to know when to stop. And you definitely want to stop before you go over the edge of the stone. If you go over the edge of the stone with the pressure engaged, uh, you're likely to break the tympan, or even worse, you might break the stone. And speaking of pressure, let's go ahead and set that up. I'm gonna show it on this Charles Brand press because the press that I own, no one else owns, and so there's really no point into explaining that. So go ahead and slide your stone underneath the scraper bar, place down your tympan, and then we're gonna go ahead and lower the pressure handle. And on the Tackish presses, these are the big ones that stick up top. And right now, there should be zero resistance because we backed it up all the way off. And then we're gonna start tightening this pressure knob and turn this as far as you can by hand. You know, actually try to crank that down there and then go ahead and raise the pressure bar and then on the Charles brand you're going to do about a 180 churn to about three quarters churn of extra pressure and then go ahead and re-engage that lock knob and that should be about the right amount of pressure. For you tackish owners I recommend about a third churn of extra pressure after you've already hand tightened it. Now these are just starting pressure recommendations. You're probably going to have to adjust the pressure after you've taken your first print on good paper and your first print on good paper is probably going to be a little bit too light anyways. One of the tools you can use to dial in that pressure is to look at your paper after you've printed it. Now this effect is too subtle for me to capture on camera, but you're going to check if the texture of your paper has been changed by the litho press. A good amount of pressure will ever so slightly change the texture of where the scraper bar has touched down, but if there's a clear defined line of where the scraper bar has been and hasn't been on your paper, then I think you have a little bit too much pressure. Now that your pressure is dialed in, let's go ahead and get started. And so we're going to go ahead and remove that gum arabic layer that's protecting the stone by rinsing it off with some water. And I want to emphasize again that you should get a clean sponge after you've cleaned off this dirty gum arabic. Now we're going to enter our printing rhythm. And if you've never printed a litho before, it would be incredibly helpful to have another set of hands to help you out with this. Uh, you would not believe how helpful it is to have a sponger help you. And so have your sponger constantly keep the stone damp using the corner method of sponging that I mentioned earlier and only stop when you're about to roll up with ink. And you should be rolling slowly over the stone this time. Uh, fast passes will put down very little ink and slow passes will start to put down more ink. If you don't have a sponger, your stone's going to try and dry out on you while you're rolling up your ink. So make sure to keep an eye on your stone and keep it constantly damp and to avoid adding too much water at once for reasons we'll talk about later. 
Now let's slow down this footage of me inking up a stone because there's a few things going on that might not be so obvious. So I'm gonna land my roller in that margin between the border and my image. I'm gonna roll forward, pressing the roller hard into my stone. And then before I roll off the edge of the stone, I'm gonna roll it backwards. And then I'm going to lift the roller off the stone and then twist the roller a little bit and land it back down so it doesn't land in the same spot that it ended on. And then I'm gonna pass over the roller once more and back. And each time I pass over the image, that's considered one pass. So I just did four passes. And then I'm gonna take my roller, go back to my ink slab, recharge it, and then go for four more passes. And each of those four passes, we're gonna call one set. And so I recommend starting with two sets of four passes and then printing a newsprint and then see where to go from there. And I know there's gonna be a lot of controversy about this topic, but I prefer to wipe my stone before I print it. As long as you're using not a lot of water, it shouldn't displace any of the ink and you shouldn't leave streak marks on your stone. If you use too much water before you print, it will leave streak marks on your ink. Some people say not to wipe over your image before you print your stone, but in my experience, I usually find that I get less scumming in my image area if I wipe away all those loose particles before I print. Now, I've put two pieces of newsprint over my stone, one to print on and one for a bit of a cushion. And then I'm gonna put down my hard tympan and then I'm going to take my grease spreader and scoop out a little bit of grease and spread it down in a line at the front edge of my tympan. And for your litho press, you probably have to unlock the press bed uh, right here and then push the press bed forward until you kind of reach your first tape mark. And then we're gonna go ahead and engage the clutch for the press bed movement, which is located right here. And you're gonna rotate this knob until it clicks into place. Now you're gonna lower down your pressure bar all the way down for me, I'm gonna clamp this head down onto my press and that will engage the pressure. And you want the scraper bar to land into that line of grease that you put down. Otherwise, it won't move when you turn the crank. So go ahead and start cranking your stone through the press and the scraper bar is gonna transfer all that pressure down and make your paper touch your stone. And hopefully it'll pull all of that ink off of the stone and onto the paper. And essentially, that's how lithography works. You're just gonna keep repeating this over and over again. Now, usually your first print is gonna be pretty light and that's normal and that's what you want. You wanna slowly build up that ink layer rather than trying to flood your stone with too much ink at once. And it's gonna be this game of trial and error of trying to find how many sets, how many times do you have to recharge your roller on your slab until you get a good print. Once you start pulling good newsprints, it's time to move on to some good paper. And so when we move on to our good paper, we're finally going to utilize those T and bar registration marks that we put onto the stone and on the back of our paper. And so it's going to be a bit hard to see, but I'll try to enhance it for you all. Uh, I'm going to take my paper and on the back side, the part that has the T on it, and I'm going to take this straight edge of the paper and line it up with the perpendicular mark on the stone. And once those are lined up, I'm going to shift it down until that halfway mark makes the halfway mark on the stone. And so once those are all lined up, I'm gonna take my thumb over here, pinch down on the spot so it can't move. And then I'm going to stretch the paper over to the other side and I'm going to line up the bar or halfway point on the paper with the bar or halfway point on the stone. And so both halfway points on both sides of the paper should line up with the halfway points on the stone. And for a one color image, it might seem like unnecessary complications but you're gonna get a much more consistent result than just dropping your paper onto the stone randomly. And if you're going to do multiple layers, it's definitely gonna play a big part in making sure that each print is consistently in the same spot with the other layers. And so I've got my stone inked up, good paper, some newsprint for padding, my hard tympan. I'm gonna take my grease from the bottom, put it back at the start of my print. I'm going to engage the pressure and then I'm going to engage the clutch on my press and then crank the handle until my print has made it all the way through until the next stop mark that I taped out onto the press bed. Try to keep your speed consistent. And then once you've reached the end of the track, don't forget to disengage your clutch by pulling it out and then turning it a little bit and then disengage your pressure. And then depending on your press, you can take your print off now or you can move your press bed all the way back to the start. Remember to disengage your clutch before moving the press bed, otherwise that thing's going to spin and whack you in the arm. 
So I'm just going to reset my press over here. And then we're just back to sponging, back to inking, and then just rinse and repeat. And a lot of this is going to come down to experience and troubleshooting. I'm going to make this look pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of things going on right now. So I'm doing six passes before I sponge the stone again. Uh, it really depends. It depends on how fast your stone dries. Some stones dry faster than others, and you only be able to get to do four passes. And how much ink is on your roller, you know, kind of depends on how your last print looked. And so I can't give you any sort of definitive uh, set rule of how many passes of ink can you put onto your stone before you print. It's really just going to be a thing of trial and error and something you'll have to get used to on your own. And so just start printing, get some experience. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's going to get frustrating sometimes, but it's all worth it in the end when you start pulling these prints. And so here's the result of the print I've been working on for the past few days. And a lot of people say lithography is just drawing with extra steps, but I think it's so much more fun than just drawing. I don't know. There's something about the feel of putting that crown to the stone that's so much more better than paper. The richness of the ink and the fact that I have more than one of these. And so before I start cleaning up after this print, uh, let's talk about some troubleshooting steps. Now, if you also have a really light print, it might be worth checking into how much water you're putting onto the stone. Like I mentioned earlier, you should be recharging your roller in between sets. This is less so uh, for getting more ink onto your roller. You actually have more ink than you need on your roller, but this is to get the water off of your roller. And so using my little brayer over here, this line right here represents a dry brayer and how much ink it can put down. And now I'm gonna run that brayer fully inked across a wet stone, and then we're gonna see how it performs. And so you can see it puts down less ink because it has a coat of water that just kind of inhibits it. Now, if we put way too much water on the stone and we try to roll it out, you're gonna see that we're putting down no ink anymore. And so let this be my warning to you, don't use too much water. Another common printing problem that I see is called scumming. And so that's ink in areas that you don't want it to be. And so my sketch is still really light, so I don't have too much ink. But if you look at my stone, a lot of my fine values have been filled in and the whole image looks very muddied up. And this can be caused by a lot of things, not waiting long enough between your etches, using really dirty sponges, your ink is too loose, or you didn't have enough water on your stone when you rolled over it. Regardless, once the ink's in these areas you don't want them to be, it can be hard to get rid of it, even if you fix these problems. And especially resist the urge to scrub at it with a blue towel or a sponge, because that will make it worse. But I will teach you the recipe for anti-tint, which is a solution you can use to scrub the scumming off your stone and it won't mess with your drawing and it will help prevent it from coming back. And so to make anti-tint, we're going to take five ounces of water. And so I'm going to put four in now and the last ounce at the end just to rinse out my cup. One ounce of gum arabic and then six drops of phosphoric. And then dump that in with the rest of it. I'm going to pour in that last glass of water and then stir it all together. Now, I know it seems crazy, but we're gonna take this solution and we're gonna take a rag. If you have a piece of felt, it's even better. Wet the stone and we're just gonna slap this all over the stone. And so, if you scrub out your scumming with some anti-tint, it'll help prevent it from coming back so easily. And it's okay to run this over your image area too. Just uh, don't scrub super hard, but you can kind of press in and just kind of remove all the loose ink from your image area and it'll also help keep your fine lines clean. Now, there are a ton of problems you can encounter while printing. And of course, printing changes from day to day with the humidity, the dryness, the temperature of your room. So many variables come into it. And so I can't address all of the problems that you might have, but those are two common ones I often see when people start learning to do lithography. Now, let's go to the cleanup. So if I had my stone and I want to print more of it at a later date, I would simply roll it up with ink like I'm about to print it, but instead of printing it, I would dust it with rosin, talc, and then just pure gum arabic over the whole stone and then buff it down with a cheesecloth. And then you can put that away for storage and then rub out the ink with some mineral spirits and then proceed like you printed like you did the first time. Now, if you're completely done with the stone, like I am right here, we're gonna do what's called a wet washout. And so we're gonna flood the stone with water, a lot of water, and then we're gonna use some mineral spirits and then wipe out all of this ink. You don't have to remove all of the ink before you grain it necessarily, 
but it makes it a hell of a lot easier to grain the stone than if you had dried ink on it. Now, once you've got all the ink washed out, go ahead and wipe the stone dry to get all that solvent off of it, and then you can set it aside to be grained later. Make sure you clean up your ink slab and your roller and your ink knives and go ahead and put everything away. And then once you get around to graining your stone, just do about four passes of 80 grit just until the ghost of your old image is gone and your stone looks completely blank. And that's basically it. And now you all can say you've been blessed with the secret knowledge of lithography. So go out there and make some prints. Now, if you found my video helpful, uh, I would appreciate it if you left a like so other people know. And if you think I missed a step, uh, go ahead and leave a comment down below so other people can know. Uh, I've been wanting to make this video for a while. I've got some weird lithography experiments coming up in the future, but I felt like, you know, those experiments wouldn't mean as much if people didn't really know what kind of what the baseline for my lithography is. And so that's what this video kind of is for. And so subscribe, please, if you want to see what those lithography experiments are about in the future. See ya.